It's the World This Week, the World This Week in partnership with The Daily Beast, The Daily Beast Moscow correspondent, Anna Nemsova is with us. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. How are you? I'm, I'm doing okay. I'm going to ask Victor Mallet the very same yeah, question. You? Bureau Chief for the Financial Times. How are things? Very good. COVID-free so far. COVID-free so far. Yep. I had it back in March. Oh, really? Okay. Oh, good. <laughs> All right. Uh, documentary filmmaker Rosie Kalir is with us as well. Long time no see. Very glad to be back. So, glad to, so glad to welcome you. And from Brussels, Dave Clark, uh, news editor at the French news agency AFP. How are things, Dave? Oh, things are things are great here for the moment, although there's a press conference ongoing and the government is about to announce a COVID crackdown. Well, we're going to talk about that very topic uh, coming up just after I say that the World This Week, where you can join the conversation on Facebook and Twitter, hashtag World This Week. Let's begin by sparing a thought for Marine and her fiancé, engaged for 18 months, living in the Paris area, their dream of a wedding back in July, postponed due to COVID, make that one postponement and counting. Il m'a demandé en mariage au mois d'avril 2019. Donc euh, on était à, enfin ça fait un an et demi qu'on se projette dans cette dans ce jour. Un jour qu'on imagine depuis toujours en fait. And as we record this we're hours away from uh, the government's embarking on a new tack in this country. A 9 p.m. to 6 a.m. curfew for nine French metropolitan areas including uh, Paris. The idea this time to keep schools open, to keep businesses open, and to allow the French to travel for the fall recess holidays. Well, uh, let me begin with, with you, Victor Mal. Your, your thoughts on the mood this Friday in Paris? I think people are kind of resigned to this. People knew this was coming. And it has the benefit of clarity. At least you know where you stand. You know, Unless you have a very good reason, you're not supposed to be out after 9 o'clock. In the UK, it's a lot more complicated because people don't really know what the rules are and whether they should mix their households. At least in this case, it's fairly fairly straightforward what you should and shouldn't do, which I think you know is one benefit. The other issue in all countries which have these kind of crackdowns is enforcement. Uh, and Castex said, you know, he the, the prime, prime minister, minister Jean Castex, he said he, you can't, you know, legally enforce a thing that limits the number of people meeting over a private dinner to six people, but he would like them to do that. And, and I think, again, that's just, a, in a sense, an acknowledgement of reality that governments can't really go around enforcing the law in people's homes on who they meet and who they have dinner with. Um, you know, but uh, I, I think, you know, this curfew measure at least has the benefit of clarity, which I, I was expected by people, I think, for some time. Yeah, it's all about the messaging, isn't it? Because, and we heard the French president on Wednesday say that, that you know, this time trying to federate people more and being a, perhaps a little less coercive in his... Uh... And he spoke a lot of, uh, he's repeated many times, a common sense of want people to, you know, engage their common sense. This is half, this will be half the battle won. And I think that uh, his messaging, again, if you're going to compare his messaging to that, to the British government, is just very, very clear. Um, it was obviously an interview situation when he spoke uh, uh, on television on Wednesday. And, um, you know, there were some answers that he didn't have, de he did didn't have detailed uh, answers, replies to the journalist, but was very clear that, you know, my ministers will take this up um, later in the week and, and you'll hear more. So he was, yeah, I think he was really straight to the point. All right, he, yeah. pl he played good cop rather than bad cop, uh, saying at one point, it's hard to be 20 in 2020, uh, Emmanuel Macron, who made it crystal clear that, yes, this curfew concept was indeed aimed at young people. ...de réduire les contacts privés qui sont les contacts les plus dangereux, qui est souvent des moments de convivialité, il faut bien le dire, c'est ça qui est cruel dans cette, la gestion de cette maladie, des moments où on risque de s'infecter parce qu'on va être, être trop proches les uns des autres pendant une certaine durée. It's hard to be 20 in 2020 unless, well, unless you engage in a bit of Gallic rule bending. Ouais. Si, euh, si on se rend compte que euh, le 1er décembre, ça, 1er décembre, on se rend compte que euh, la propagation a chuté, que le nombre de cas est divisé par 3, euh, bon, on, euh, on se donne juste de rendez-vous dans un mois. Donc, si c'est un mois de sacrifice, c'est pas, pas horrible. Forcément, on va diminuer, mais je vais pas non plus arrêter de ma vie sociale, quoi, parce que sinon, on, on va rien faire. On va s'adapter. Je viendrai plus tôt et à la rigueur, je dormirai euh, sur place, quoi. I'll spend the night at my friend's house. Did you hear that, Dave Clark? 
I think that's something that will be coming here to Belgium very soon. We understand that uh, any minute now, the new prime minister, Mr. De Croo, is going to announce that um, all pubs and restaurants and cafes will close for a month, uh, all day. It won't be a curfew, uh, as in Paris, it will be more severe. But uh, obviously the cases here in Belgium are, uh, have been very uh, uh, growing very quickly in, in recent days. Uh, and uh, the new government is going to take a, a pretty stark act, uh, a, a lockdown for all hotels, restaurants and cafes. All restaurants, uh, uh, bars and cafes. And again, uh, it's what we've been mentioning, Dave. Are people subscribing to it? Are they obeying the rules? Well, in the interim period between the last lockdown and uh, things beginning to tighten up, uh, the, uh, the social distancing measures were breaking down. As Victor was discussing earlier, it's easier when things are clearer. Uh, obviously, when some streets you have to wear the masks and some you don't, when uh, some communes have got one set of rules and some have another, where there are time limits, where you have to estimate yourself, whether you're in a crowded area or whether it's just a few people, then it was it was tricky for people to, to follow the rules. And uh, obviously not enough people did because the cases are coming back. If uh, uh, And there was a lot of young people uh, uh, who you know resumed a normal social life for, for, uh, for, for young people. But uh, now, at least the rules are going to be clear, even if they are going to strike people, I think this was fairly severe. And just one point on that. Um, France recording more than 30,000 infections a day right now. Uh, over in Germany, they tightened restrictions on Wednesday, even though they're in the ballpark of 7,000. Uh, and the idea is, did, did the French start too late uh, with this tightening of the rules? I think a lot of people would say yes. I mean, it is very tricky because, as Macron has said, he wants to keep the economy open. He wants to, you know, he, he keeps saying, and other governments keep saying, we have to learn to live with this virus. We can't cut it down completely. But yes, I think you could argue that they did this very late. Yeah. Uh, Anna Nimsova, I know that... Uh, uh, it's been described by some as a second wave, uh, as others as the outset of the winter wave, and winter comes earlier uh, where you are. You were telling me that uh, Moscovites are wearing their masks. This time, Moscow um, is more serious about uh, coronavirus. Uh, as every day we get more than 4,000 cases in Moscow. And the Kremlin finally admits that the spread is very bad. So people are a bit confused um, as they don't see the, a clear strategy. They see that all bars and restaurants are, are open, all theaters and museums work. People still go to work, still go by metro. There is no lockdown and nobody's talking about lockdown. But at the same time, um, people see on the news that uh, two out of three doctors say that Russia is not ready for um, a really bad second, second wave. So this is a con concerning news, considering how um, bad some hospitals are in some regions, in some uh, provinces. So uh, I think people at the moment, as everybody knows, maybe 30, 40 uh, people who have been sick or who is sick now, uh, nobody knows what exactly uh, to do. The gyms are open, even gyms are working. But uh, there is uh, at least a news that schools, some, clo some schools uh, closed down and some universities um, also switched to um, Zoom teaching. So that is at least a good news. And how's morale? And how um, you mean morale in terms of um, uh, people? We are. It's, it looks serious. like we heard the French. Um, we heard the French president Anna say this is going to be with us at least until the summer of 2021. And uh, there were a lot of long faces in the newsroom the next day because it's like, hmm, when's the light at the end of the tunnel? Yes, um, well, on one hand, people feel depressed, especially older people, as they didn't understand what it was about the vaccine. First, Russia screamed, we are the first in the world to come up with a vaccine. Now we read that uh, Russia is still testing Sputnik V vaccine, and this time uh, on people who are older than 60, for people who are older than 60. So it is unclear, is vaccine going to work anytime soon? 
or is still um, in the process of being tested. Um, so I think young people are definitely killers. Uh, they're dissidents, as they say. I even met a friend who is my age who said that I am uh, a COVID dissident. Um, so it's either to constantly think about it and talk about it or um, actually cope with the idea that it's going to be with us forever and continue living as we used to live. I don't know if it works. Does it work for you? It's a difficult one. I think there's a wide spectrum between uh, it being over in a month and forever. Uh, I know that uh, over in the UK, where restrictions are tightening and ICUs are filling up fast, uh, there's a brewing tug of war between Greater Manchester, which is refusing to follow nearby Liverpool into a state of near total lockdown, and the uh, government in London. All right, we'll hear from we'll hear from the the mayor of Manchester, Andy Burnham, perhaps a a, a little bit uh, uh, later on. Andy Burnham, uh, who says he doesn't want to be the canary in the coal mine, and that the North is being asked uh, to go into this state of near total lockdown, which Liverpool has agreed to, uh, while uh, but at the while doing so um, has. Um, been uh, with what economic compensation, Rosie Clear? In terms of the fact that um, he's wondering how he's going to get. He's saying, no, we're not going to do it until you give us, uh, you know, guarantees on, 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 on what the economic compensation, because the, the North got battered during lockdown, he says. Yeah. And also, I mean, I was just reading yesterday that there are some, you know, hot spots, as it were, in, in the south of England. Oxford apparently has a, a high infection rate, as high as uh, places like Cle Cleveland in the north of England. So why why is it that the northern cities are being uh, targeted? And then um, the more sort of, uh, I guess, uh, left wing uh, newspapers are also saying that, um, you know, the, the places where police put, you know, being locked down are those that are, you know, are run by um, Labour Council. So is it being politicised, the lockdown? And I think that this is the perception um, some people in the north of, of England. Uh, there, are, there are parallels with uh, Marseille and Paris. You know, when, when Paris, when Marseille restaurants and bars had to close early and, and so on, there was a lot of complaints in Marseille that the people in Paris were, you know, were sort of unfairly condemning Marseille to economic meltdown, whereas they in Paris had a situation that was almost as bad and they weren't doing anything. And of course, now that has been changed and now Paris is in the same boat as Marseille. But there was quite a long period of kind of anger in Marseille against Paris, which is not necessarily a new thing, but it's a similar kind of, you know, battles between regions and political parties over who gets locked down and, and whether it's a, the right way to go. Well, let's talk to the resident northerner on this panel. Uh, Dave Clark, uh, your native Newcastle uh, is not yet on that list of tier three, uh, which is the the, the most str the strictest uh, uh, measures that the government is is putting in place. Your thoughts on this tug of war between Manchester and London? It, it uh, reminds me a little bit. I mean, uh, here we're going uh, going back quite a long while, but uh, when the uh, uh, Margaret Thatcher's government attempted to uh, impose a a poll tax, as it was called, a community charge, the, a new form of local taxation. They trialled it in Scotland first, and uh, obviously it proved to be unpopular wherever the tax went, but uh, particularly in Scotland, because they felt that they were being singled out uh, as guinea pigs. This is always going to be a problem if you uh, divide up uh, a country in this way, and obviously uh, you know, the UK is not a unitary state uh, to begin with, and there is a, already a great north-south divide in terms of uh, uh, of the economy, which uh, Boris Johnson's government has promised to, to level up in some way. We've seen similar uh, similar issues here uh, in Belgium, obviously another country that's divided north and south. Uh, they've been, uh, the mayors in Flanders have not wanted people coming out of Brussels to come to visit the uh, the resorts on the Flanders coast. And the one mayor is, says that his hospital is, uh, could be overrun by people from Brussels. And there's all sorts of ugly undertow there as well, because it's a dog whistle issue often for the uh, the largely white Flanders towns that they, they don't want uh, people coming from Brussels who speak French or might be of Arabic descent or uh, of uh, immigrant stock. And uh, it, it plays into a kind of nasty uh, hard right politics in some of these areas. But what do you do right now when those ICUs are filling up? 
Well, uh, the ICUs haven't uh, been overwhelmed here yet. In uh, no, I'm, I'm asking in, about. In I'm obviously asking. I'm obviously asking here about the north of England, where uh, there was a figure like oh, something like ninety five percent in Liverpool. Well, Liverpool then accepted to go into tier three measures, but obviously it'll take a while before uh, we see whether we you know, see whether that will work. Um, the other. Other towns in the in the north will uh, will, will take a different uh, approach, apparently, uh, and it's not clear to me whether the central government can force these uh, these councils to to fall into line. Yeah. Although national opinion polls do suggest that Brits do support tougher measures, but they don't like it when it's applied to them. <laughs> they don't like it when it's applied to them. Uh, Victor Mallet, we're also coming at the same time in a parallel universe. There's been this EU summit that Dave's been covering. Uh, where we've just heard that uh, the uh, UK trade negotiator has told the, his EU counterpart not to come to London next Monday. Um, is this to change the conversation away from COVID? Uh, I mean, I think, you know, Brexit is coming to a head and it's very, very important uh, for both sides, both the European Union, the 27 that remain and the UK to come to some kind of agreement. And both sides want an agreement, but obviously they're in the final stages of this very tough negotiation about the future trade relationship. So I think at this stage, it's not to distract attention from COVID. I think it's I think, in fact, COVID was used to distract attention from Brexit at one point. I think now we're in a situation where you know, an, uh, an agreement is is probably imminent, although, of course, both sides are playing very hardball and saying it's impossible, you know, we, we can't accept these kind of conditions. But most people think eventually, you know, Boris Johnson's government hasn't completely ruled out coming back to the negotiating table. Um, they've just said that they'll only do it if the Europeans, you know, make a move. So I, I think there's still room for, for some kind of deal there. Dave Clark, you agree? Yeah, I think the deal's quite close. I think uh, we always knew there'd be a lot of uh, shouting in the in the closing stages. Uh, rather than this distracting attention from COVID, COVID almost distracted attention from this. Uh, the, the Finnish uh, Prime Minister, Sanna Marin, uh, left the summit early. Uh, Ursula von der Leyen barely attended at all. Both of those went into self-isolation because they'd been uh, with people who had been uh, infected by the virus. The Polish Prime Minister never came, Mr. Morawiecki. He uh, stayed in Poland because uh, he is uh, self-isolating as well. And quite a few of the uh, of the leaders who came here uh, complained. They said that this summit wasn't important enough to take the risk. You know, in, in theory, in Belgium, you're only allowed to have three people around for dinner. Uh, but uh, they had 27 last night, 27 leaders of the European countries, all, I suppose, since the poll wasn't there, and uh, 26. Uh, and... Now there is a summit, an informal summit that was to be held in the middle of next month in Berlin, which we thought was the secret backup Brexit summit where they were actually going to put this deal through. But that is now no longer going to be a face to face event. And there are a lot of officials here say that you can have a kind of fake summit by video conference. But you can't discuss, uh, you know, hopefully we're talking on, on this show via Zoom with uh, uh, with uh, with some depth, but uh, they can't get into the depth of the of the issues when they're when they are over the uh, over the remote links. And in fact, during the Brexit section of this summit, they had their phones taken away from them so they could meet secretly. And there's no way you could ensure secrecy during the meeting uh, if everyone was back in their home office. Yeah, the the, the limits of a return to. Uh uh, well, near total lockdown or to curfews and working from home, something we're going to be grappling with for a long while yet. Stay with us. There's more to come. You're watching The World This Week. Just joining us, it's The World This Week. The World This Week in partnership with The Daily Beast, The Daily Beast, Moscow correspondent Anna Nemsova is with us. We want to welcome back as well Victor Mallet, who is Paris Bureau Chief for The Financial Times a newspaper. A documentary filmmaker Rosie Collier joins us as well. And uh, from Brussels, Dave Clark of the French news agency Agence France Presse. First, it was called a ceasefire, but you could, it's more of a lull. The death toll from the worst border clashes in a quarter century between Armenia and Azerbaijan uh, appear much greater than official tallies on both sides say. And again this Friday, there are claims and counterclaims 
with Baku accusing backers of the separatists in Nagorno-Karabakh of shelling a new region of Azerbaijan and Yerevan claiming the execution of two Armenian uh, war uh, prisoners. Uh, Anna Nemsova, uh, there's a lot happening, it seems, at Russia's borders these days. Uh, would you say that uh, right now, Russia, which has good relations with both Armenia and uh, Azerbaijan, has a plan? We saw last week that they tried to get that, that truce going. Well, yes, um, Russia is trying to stay neutral, uh, keep both Azerbaijan and Armenia as its partners. Um, I was in Azerbaijan in February, right before the pandemic, covering the parliamental elections. And no matter who I spoke with, whether it was a conversation about Trump's tower or um, politics, corruption, or hipsters' art, um, any conversation gradually um, shifted into this big talk about the war and how necessary it is to get the territories back and all 600,000 refugees um, so people could go, could go back home. So it seems um, the war is on everybody's mind and there, I didn't find a single peacemaker Nobody proposed uh, some sort of a peaceful solution. People uh, are convinced in Azerbaijan that the war is the only solution, unfortunately. Uh, and this is very um, concerning. Today we hear that uh, Iran might get involved, and that, that is a, a really scary. Uh, as Iran reported, uh, its territories have been shelled. Armenia wants Iran to get involved, and as they say, move uh, artillery um, away from, uh, Azeri, Azeri artillery away from its borders. Iran has um, all three uh, participants on its border, Azerbaijan, Armenia, and Karabakh, uh, self-proclaimed Republic of Artsakh. So um, Azerbaijan seems to be uh, constantly supported by Erdogan, and Erdogan um, is convinced that the war is the only way for Azerbaijan to get the territories back. Uh, so uh, the, the worst scenario would be if Russia gets involved, uh, Russian military or Turkish military or Iranian military, and it um, grows into a big, uh, terrible war. As was said a week ago on this show, what is different this time is Turkey going all in on the side of Baku. France 24's Catherine Norris Trent sat down with Azerbaijan's president, Ilan Aliyev. How many Turkish drones are you deploying? <laughs> we have enough in order to achieve our uh, targets. I, I think that you can understand me that this is information which I prefer not to disclose. But are they making the difference in this conflict for you? Uh, of course. They are very uh, uh, modern, sophisticated uh, weapons. And I can tell you, only by the drones which we acquired from Turkey, we destroyed Armenian uh, military equipment worth $1 billion. Yeah, unfortunately, Rosie Kaleer, when you listen to those remarks, it kind of lean, leads credence. This interview was done a couple of days ago, but still that, uh, if anything, this lull is, uh, is, ju is just to prepare for more intense fighting. Yeah, and I think it talks as well to an extent of, of an arms race, really, and particularly with regards to, to drones, Turkish drones. That's been very important to Turkey for the past 20 years. They've been developing um, that side of their weapons industry. And um, I read recently that they're only fourth to you know, the US, Israel, and China in, in developing drones, and they're obviously using those in, in Syria, in Iraq, and now in um, in this conflict. And I think it's interesting as well that, um, that the drain, drones are effective because of the terrain. It's mountainous, and they don't want necessarily to put boots on the ground because we saw, what, 20, 25 years ago, uh, 30,000 troops on both sides dying. It's a really difficult uh, place to fight, and, you know, huge sort of battalions of troops get um, ambushed easily. But drones, you can do quite a lot of um, both you know, it's precision stuff, but it's also, you know, you can target uh, villages uh, quite accurately, but without um, having to shed, shed blood. So I think it's a, yeah, just an extension, really, of, um, of uh, Erdogan's, um, you know, entry into this uh, sort of arms race.
Yeah. What again? What's a question we ask often? What is Turkey's end game? Is it uh, to have complete military victory and to go all in? Uh, and, and will it escalate, or is it well to get a place at the table since they're not one of the official negotiators and all? Yeah, this? I mean it's a good question. I don't know who started this particular sort of round of, of fighting, but but clearly the new factor in all this uh, is the rise of Turkey and its extremely sort of aggressive and uh, uh, foreign policy and, and and military policy essentially in its own region, which has definitely been expanding in all kinds of areas. It's it's happening in the eastern Mediterranean around Cyprus, you know, with oil exploration in contested waters. It's happening in Libya. Uh, it's happening in Syria and, and so on. So so clearly, it's Erdogan's uh, um, new kind of extremely forceful policies that have that have changed things. And and I mean, uh, you know, we had a you had an interview with the Azerbaijan uh, president just now. We we. We interviewed the Financial Times, we interviewed the Armenian president the other day, and he was saying, you know, Turkey wants to create another Syria in the Caucasus. So it, it, there is a lot of concern, obviously, on both sides. And I think Turkey is the factor that, is, that has changed. And, and Russia has ended up in, in the middle of this um, and trying to sort of keep, keep, both sides, uh, keep both sides calm. But it's going to be extremely difficult. And then, Absova, one final question on this. When you look at what right now is uh, in Vladimir Putin's entree, uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, um, Kyrgyzstan, where we've seen the upheaval of the past week and, and street protests leading to the ouster of another president, Syria, Libya, Belarus, uh, and also uh, those sanctions that have been slapped by the EU on uh, some inside his entourage, including the head of the FSB, uh, 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 over uh, Alexei Navalny's poisoning. What would you say is top of that list? Well, it, it, it always depends on um, which news you read. And if you look at uh, the Kremlin's newspapers like uh, Rasiska Gazeta or Izvestia, you will not see a word on Navalny. Um, there will be lots of headlines on coronavirus. Uh, some relationships with United States. But if you look at the independent media, obviously uh, Navalny will be among top uh, headlines and, and then Nagorno-Karabakh and Belarus. Um, today, uh, everybody is discussing sanctions. Uh, everybody, I mean, uh, public figures who still talk to journalists, uh, they are very concerned about uh, EU sanctions against Russia and whether uh, there will be more American sanctions to follow. More American sanctions uh, to follow. And we heard some strong words from the uh, 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 from the from the uh, the U.S. this past week on that. Nigeria's president began the week by disbanding SARS. SARS is an acronym for the police's notorious special anti-robbery squad. Uh, but end SARS protests, well, they continue with demonstrators fearing that the plainclothes unit uh, formed in 1992 to tackle violent crimes such as carjackings and armed robberies and kidnappings will continue to kill and extort, but under a different guise. There are still those who are held in their various cells, even as we protest now, who probably don't even know what they have done, or for very minimal offenses. We need to reach out. We need to reach out to them. We need to hear their stories. We need to go to the cells. I want my mom to be happy in the future. I don't want to die young. I'm not a thief. I'm a music producer. Answers. I'm not a thief. I'm a musical producer. Rosie Collier. Yeah, and I think that this is what um, really struck at the heart of this particular round of protests um, is that it's really about young people, um, young entrepreneurs in Nigeria, um, where there's you know high unemployment, but people pretty much have to make opportunities for themselves, and the fact that it's the this unit SARS that has been disbanded that would prey on people who are just you know you know filmmakers, whether they be tech and entrepreneurs, and I think that that's um, really struck prey on them. The how what they they see the way they're dressed? Exactly, it's about appearance, and if they've got nice cars, then it's just assumed that they are criminals, and um, and therefore they can be sh shaken down. And um, but as I say, you know, Lagos, particularly the you know the southern the most um, populous city, is a very entrepreneurial place, and people you know do make money also in very you know honest ways. And so I think there's that. And then also, of course, this is a, you know it's a protest against uh, the old guard of 
the government, you know, the president is 77, Mohamedou Buhari, he came in and promised in uh, 2015 of stamping out corruption, improving security and creating jobs. And I think that this feeds into all of those three things in the way that SARS, uh, you know, is perceived to um, sort of fuel corruption. It is... Um, seed as well as sort of contributing to insecurity and then also you know young preying on young people who are finding opportunities for themselves because those jobs you know six years down the line have not been created by the government of uh, Mohamedou Buhari as yet. D Dave Clark again uh, let's go over that timeline on Monday uh, President Buhari announces that SARS is uh, is disbanded and yet the protests continue did that surprise you? No uh <laughs> Obviously, they uh, created another police unit, a SWAT unit, uh, very shortly afterwards. Which, so a lot of people over there will be uh, suspicious that uh, SARS has simply been rebadged. Uh, and um, Nigerians often uh, uh, like to uh, make humor out of uh, the many acronyms in their countries. And very quickly, the, uh, the SWAT team was renamed by some of the protesters, uh, the uh, SARS without any training, uh, which is... Uh, uh, Kind of how they will see how they will see this new unit, but in a way, uh, this kind of protest could have started from almost uh, any spark. SARS has been around. Uh, is, well, it was already there when I lived in Nigeria. That was 16 years ago. Um, it's been a long-standing unit, and uh, it's been a long-standing problem. The uh, the Nigerian police force is a very complicated thing. Over the years, many special weapons units have been added to it, in part to but give the civilian authorities an armed force that could balance up the military, which has been involved in coup d'etat in, in, in the past. And uh, uh, the Nigerians I knew at the time used to say that uh, they put soldiers in the police patrols to keep the police honest, but uh, that just made the, uh, the, the soldiers more corrupt. Um, yeah, so there could have been, uh, these protests could have been sparked um, by a lot of injustices in Nigeria, SARS has been the, the rallying cry, and it seems to have brought huge crowds out. And uh, uh, as we can see from you, from your footage, uh, you know, mainly young young people at the heart of this movement. Uh, but Nigeria is a very young country; you know, half the population is uh, is is, an, is under twenty, and it's a very big population. And uh, frustration at the uh, various injustices of Nigerian life would boil over for something. And now this has got started. Be interesting to see where it goes. This is also, uh, Victor Mallet, if I'm not, not, not wrong, a tale of globalization because we saw the Black Lives Matter protests in the United States. And then uh, in France, uh, there was protests against police brutality linked to local issues, uh, which popped up. And this was during confinement and it caught people off guard. There is, it's also because we're watching the news in other countries. Yeah, I mean, the, this was, I think, partly inspired by Black Lives Matter. That's what people are saying. And, you know, you had Kanye West, uh, the rapper, talking about, you know, giving his support to the protesters against against this uh, this police unit. There is a kind of crisis of policing that, that is, you know, appears in different countries. In a lot of developing countries, one of the problems is that the police, as Rosie said, are very corrupt. Uh, you know, they're often underpaid, so that it's in their interest, as it were, to part of their job is to sort of shake people down at roadblocks and demand money from them. There's another problem which I think extends to a lot of countries, including quite rich countries, and that is this tendency to use, um, you know, plainclothes policemen, uh, whether it's in France or the US or or, uh, or in Nigeria, to sort of do the dirty work. And I think that is, it's a very dangerous tendency because, you know, some tough guy in a leather jacket comes up to you and starts beating you up and he says, I'm a policeman. I mean, how do you know he's a policeman? I think there's a real problem with that. And people, young people, especially educated people, maybe especially really resent that. You know, they don't want to be, uh, you know, they don't want to be targeted by somebody who claims to be a policeman, even if the person is a policeman. It's it simply is a sort of way of the government doing some dirty business that really should be done by uniformed cops. Yeah, and in Msova, that that's one of the signatures of this outfit. It's they were in plain clothes. Uh, is this a conversation people are having in Russia? Um, about police? I'm sorry, Francois? Yes, about, about policing and uh, re police reform. Uh, about police reform in Russia? Well, um, you know, police in general uh, here in Moscow is, is a very strong symbol. You see police everywhere. You see police in, in the streets, and um, there's more police than ever. 
uh, and there are no protests, no political protests in Moscow. Even single uh, man uh, protests have been banned during the pandemic. Uh, so um, we've had uh, a number of uh, very scary uh, news in Russia when uh, protesters were uh, arrested and got uh, sentences for demonstrating um, uh, against uh, some police violence. And uh, police violence is a symbol of um, of the regime in a way. Uh, people are afraid of, uh, of long sentences of uh, prison terms. So one final question on this, Rosie Clear. Th this, is there a sense that in a way, could this be a good news story for Nigeria, that there's a, this demand for more accountability? In some ways, yes. And I have to point out as well, this NSARS uh, hashtag goes back to 2017, actually, and was um, you know, being pushed by an advocacy group sort of headed by uh, a man named uh, Shegan Awasanya. And he uh, and, and different um, groups have been meeting with the police, with young people for all, all that time. But then suddenly this sort of powder keg has burst uh, just in the past week, um, whereby you've got, you know, people taken to the streets and, and it's, you know, sort of been said that it's a, a leaderless uh, movement now and and it's true in many ways i think uh, people who are disgruntled about all, you know a whole raft of different things have just sort of um, jumped on the bandwagon of this hashtag to express their disappointment with you know all kinds of things and and i wonder if the in, uh, original intended uh, uh, purpose of this which was to get justice for the victims and there are hundreds of people who apparently have um, you know either been disappeared or you know been killed certainly um, by by sars and i wonder if in the end after all these protests uh, die down which inevitably they will if uh, the intended sort of cause of um, uh, or purpose of nsars will in the end give justice for, to those that they were originally calling for um, for justice to be served. Yeah, and the economic pressures of COVID uh, perhaps adding to that powder keg as, as you describe it. We, we began this, this show asking uh, if Marine, that fiance, would still get her, her dream wedding in these times of COVID. Uh, all Parisians can use a bit of escape and romance these days. So what do they make here of a Netflix series that plays well to a whole heck of stereotypes about the French? Emily Cooper? Bonjour. Bonjour. I got a feeling I'm in trouble when I look at you. Uh, I'm Emily. You're a new neighbor? Enchanté. Because once I do it, yeah, I know I'll never get enough. So, yes, we're talking about Emily in Paris, and uh, with us is uh, Financial Times television critic uh, Victor Mallet. Uh, you wrote last week that the series makes Jean-Pierre Genet's uh, 2001 film Amélie uh, look like a 90-minute documentary. Well, I was quoting a guy called Bertrand Chamorrois, actually, who, who's a, a sort of commentator, and he, he had this wonderful... Exp uh, phrases to explain the kind of cliches. He said, Parisians are layabouts, alcoholics, chain smokers, disagreeable and lecherous, and they all live in a wonderful theme park. All men are pickup artists, all prisons have extramarital affairs, all shopkeepers are unpleasant, and all the French have names that make you want to wear a beret and carry a baguette under your arm. Those are the kind of cliches that are, that are put out there. And I heroically watched all 10 episodes in one night uh, in order to write my story. So, yes, I, I briefly became the television critic. How did you feel but, after 10 episodes? Well, it, you know, at the beginning, when I watched the first one, I thought, that's it, I can't watch any more. It's too absurd and it's too, you know, meaningless and, and light. But when I had to watch the, the next nine, I thought, well, you know, it's OK. And what really surprised me was that the Parisians themselves are not actually angry about these vaguely absurd stereotypes they actually find it quite a nice form, many of them anyway, find it quite a nice form of light relief from, from uh, you know, having to worry about COVID and having to worry about curfews and lockdowns. Uh, and, uh, you know, so in fact, people were more kind of welcoming than I expected of the series in Paris. Uh, more welcoming. And yeah, we, we mentioned the beret wearing, for instance, the magazine Grazia in an article entitled, Is Emily in Paris Actually That Bad? Uh, displays... Uh, the, the lead character wearing, in this, in this instance, a kind of a purple beret. Uh, and uh, what we have found, Dave Clark, is uh, that the city of Paris uh, and the tourism board does little to uh, dispel stereotypes. Uh, hey, there's no such thing as bad publicity, right? Uh, well, there's another um, 
uh, movie about Paris that's coming out now. They've remastered uh, in 4K uh, Maciej Katowice's uh, film, That N. And I do wonder whether Emily Pax will attract tourist fans than, uh, than That N, which obviously tells a quite different story uh, uh, about, uh, about the life in the streets of Paris, one where the uh, uh, it's more in common with the uh, the anti-SARS protests, perhaps, and it's tales of police brutality and uh, people uh, living on the edge of society. TV is about is often about escapism, uh, and uh, I'm sure there are a lot of cliches on French TV about Amer about America that Americans wouldn't recognise. And I think if the purpose of this show was to generate publicity for itself, then uh, my Twitter timeline would suggest that a lot of my Parisian friends are watching it. They're not all watching it because they like it. Some of them are watching it so they can, uh, you know, they can tweet abuse about it, but they must have seen it. Uh, and I'm sure uh, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of people who say they hate it who are going to watch every episode. Uh, Anna Nemsova, uh, have you watched Emily in Paris? Um, I, I have, in fact. Uh, I looked, uh, skipped through a few episodes, but uh, I've got the idea here. And um, I know Russian students uh, who have watched it and discussed it. I think, um, as you know well, in Russia, Paris um, is definitely romanticized and uh, Russian elite go to France uh, when they could go to France for vacation. And some have apartments there. Um, Russian intellectuals obviously uh, adore French culture. Uh, French museums, French art. Um, with America, Russia has its own stereotypes about Americans. Um, there are not too many Americans uh, left in Russia. There may be only 12, a dozen uh, American journalists still accredited in Russia. Um, but it seems that um, everybody knows what Americans like. Uh, my American friends complain that taxi drivers tell them what Americans like. Um, but young people uh, love America. They love Netflix. They like um, American music, and they they dress up uh, as American teenagers. So, so uh, there are lots of bridges through culture, definitely. So and there is a festival of American movies going on. That's, that's, that's fascinating what you're saying. And Victor Mallet, this kind of answers a bit the point about why the French like it. And I'll put it to you, Rosie Collier, which is maybe this series, even though it's set in Paris, says more about Americans than it does about yeah, the French. Yeah, and Netflix, and Netflix expansion, right, across the world. And it just uh, earlier this year has opened a Netflix, Netflix Niger, which means Netflix Nigeria, and this kind of localization of, of, of the, their outfit. But at the same time, um, yeah, quite dependent on on perhaps more positive stereotypes of a given place. And I know that the films that they've selected from Nigeria, they're not the sort of typical um, sort of blood letting kind of uh, Nollywood films, but the films that make uh, Lagos look good, you know, and Nigerians look uh, quite good. So I think it just plays into that as part of Netflix global strategy, I guess. And to be fair, it's just as cliched about Americans. I mean, you know, Emily is, is the classic cliche. You know, she's naive. Uh, she, she comes from Chicago. Her boyfriend doesn't even have a passport until she moves to Paris. You know, a lot of the <laughs> cliches are about the Americans as well. So uh, Darren Starr is quite even-handed, and you know when he did Sex in the City about New York, that wasn't the real New York either. I mean, in, any more than this is the real Paris. It's certainly not gritty. That's <laughs> that's the one thing you can say about this series. Well, certainly not gritty. Uh... Uh, it certainly does have the newsroom divided. I want to thank you so much, Victor Mallet. I want to thank as well Rosie Collier, Dave Clark, uh, who's with us uh, from Brussels, and Anna Nemsova in uh, Moscow. We want to thank you for joining us here for The World This Week.